right. Hey, how's everybody doing? Hello. Let's get started now. Thanks. Hello. Welcome. This is Wednesday. It's week four. We are going to do a lecture on recursive backtracking today. Um, more of this exhaustive searching stuff that we started on Monday. And on Friday, homework four will go out. You'll have a while to work on homework four. It'll be a rare assignment that you have more than a week to work on uh, because of the midterm coming up in a few weeks. So, okay, um, let me just jump right into it. I don't have any announcements, I don't think, for today. So uh, here we go. And again, we're reading, if, if you read the book, uh, this material mostly comes from chapters eight and nine of the book. So that's a good reference to look at for more examples. So backtracking is kind of a special case of what we talked about last time, which was exhaustive searching. So let me remind you again, or let me uh, ask you again, I guess, what, what was that exhaustive search about? What does it mean to do an exhaustive search? Yes? So look through all possibilities, maybe a, a space of solutions to a problem, a space of um, choices you could make or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just generally speaking, can you tell me anything about the type of code or the type of algorithm strategy that you use to perform an exhaustive search recursively? Like I used some terms or some common patterns on Monday's class. Can you think of any of that, of that stuff? Uh, yeah? Tail recursion? Tail recursion. Oh, interesting. Well, I think when you're talking about tail recursion, you're talking about sort of um, moving on to the next call in a certain way. But I don't think you have to use that to, to do an exhaustive search. I mean, I'm looking for something a little bit different. What, what do you have in mind? Yeah. Uh, well, there are a bunch of choices to be made. So each recursive call has another recursive call in it that represents one of the choices. Yeah, each call, each recursive call sort of makes a choice and then goes on to the next recursive call that will make more choices, right? So it's the idea of like choosing something and then uh, exploring or searching for things that could, uh, could follow that choice, right? So that's kind of what the general template is for an exhaustive search. And the base case is like if there aren't any more decisions left to be made, we stop or we print what we decided or chose or something like that, right? And I just, I, I talked about how the base case is sort of a different, there's a different way of thinking about the base case when you do an exhaustive search. The base case isn't like, oh, you asked me to solve an easy problem, so I'll just solve it right now. It's not quite like that. It's more like, oh, the calls before me have done a bunch of work, and now we're done doing all the work, so I'm going to print something, or I'm going to return something, or, or, or something of that nature. So the base case is, is to be thought of in that way. Now, that's an exhaustive search. For each choice you could make, try it, and then search for what could follow that choice. OK, so now what's backtracking? Well, it's a, a strategy, an algorithm strategy, where you find solutions to a problem by trying out partial solutions to see if they are good or correct or promising. And if they are not correct or not suitable, you undo them and go back to where you came from. You backtrack. And uh, it's very similar to exhaustive search, except exhaustive search is kind of like a backtracking algorithm where every solution is suitable. You just have to find them all. You have to enumerate them all. You have to print them all. You have to put them all in a vector. Backtracking is like, I want to go look at all the solutions, but some of them aren't good and some of them are, and I want to keep the ones that are good. So it's kind of like exhaustive search plus filtering, you might say. Okay. And we would call it a brute force technique because it just checks everything, or, or at least it ensures that it has thought about everything. You often do this with recursion, although I don't know if I've really said this going back when we first started learning about recursion, but you know, the idea of recursion is no more or less powerful than things like looping. Uh, you actually never ever need recursion to solve a programming problem. You could literally solve every single problem without recursion, but since the strategy of these algorithms is often self-similar, recursion is often a good way to implement solutions for them. Yeah? So what's the difference again between backtracking and exhaustive search? The difference between backtracking and exhaustive search is that exhaustive search, once we get to an end point, like uh, we're trying to come up with all the four-digit binary numbers, or we're trying to come up with all the permutations of a string, once we get to an end point, once we've chosen all of the orderings of the characters or all the bits of the number, 
there's no such thing as a bad number, a bad permutation. So we just get a permutation and then we print it out or we store it or whatever. All the endpoints are good endpoints. We just want to find them all. Backtracking is like some of the endpoints are not good and I don't like them and I don't want to print them. I don't want to even uh, process them if I can avoid it. But I'll talk about how you can do that in a second. Anyway, there's lots of examples of where you might use backtracking. There's lots of games. There's lots of... Um, programming problems that involve backtracking. I think the most physically uh, understandable example is how to get out of a maze. Like basically, uh, if you're in a two-dimensional maze with walls and you can move various directions and you want to figure out like how do I get out of the maze. I mean, there's different strategies for getting out of mazes. Maybe you've heard of like right hand rule or something, but there's different ways to escape from a maze. But one strategy is just to try all the different ways. Sort of try going up, and if that works, then you got out. Otherwise, try going down. If that doesn't work, try going left. If that doesn't work, try going right. And those are sort of recursive things. Try escaping from the left. Try escaping from above me. Um, and if I go up and I walk up and it's a dead end, I need to come back to where I was. And the way you come back is by this like backtracking process. So anyway, th this idea of trying solutions and undoing if you don't like where you ended up. That's the idea of backtracking and builds on an exhaustive search. So, okay, if that's the template for how you do an exhaustive search, the template for backtracking is almost exactly the same. Watch my cool fade. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wait, that was so bad, I have to do it again. <laughs> wow, glitch in the matrix. Um, Linux can't handle how cool my slides are, I guess. Um, so I highlighted the different part. It's just, you, you choose something and you search what could follow that choice, but when you're done searching for the follow-on choices, you have to undo, you have to unmake the choice that you made. And the reason that you do this is because um, you know maybe the choosing has somehow modified the state of the world and you decided you didn't like that modification. I mean, there could be more detail here. Maybe what I might say is, if the decisions that could follow C are bad, <coughs> then unchoose C. I mean, there's variations on how you exactly code this, but the point is that it's basically an exhaustive search algorithm, but sometimes you have some logic that sort of doesn't undo on something that you chose previously. And I think you'll see, um, when we look at some problems, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about, okay? Okay, so uh, here's a quick example of something where mechanically you need to backtrack even though all the outcomes are ones that we want to print. But I'll get to one where we don't print all the outcomes in a second. So this is a problem called dice roll. I just want to print out all the possible rolls that you could do of um, two six-sided dice or three six-sided dice or, or, or whatever, right? So I think it's pretty clear that the problem is self-similar, right? Like if you look at the output for a dice roll of one, Dice roll of one would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Dice roll of two is the output of dice roll of one repeatedly with one in front of it, with two in front of it, with three in front of it. So it's kind of like you can see that dice roll of n has something to do with dice roll of n minus one. There's kind of a self-similarity here, right? Um, now, this isn't quite what I said a minute ago. I was talking about some paths being good, some outcomes being good, and others being bad, and backtracking. And that, this problem doesn't quite have that. So, but what I will say is it, I, I will use this to get to a problem that has that aspect. We are going to print all of the combinations, all of the dice rolls. So, I mean, how would you get started on a problem like this? If you had to write dice roll, here it is. If you have to roll that many dice and print out the, the different values they can have using recursion, you can think of this as an exhaustive search problem. Well, if you think about the code we did last time, when we did printing binary and we did permutations, we had to think a little bit about the parameters that we were passing along from one call to the next. What kind of things did we do with parameters on those problems? Do you have your hand up back there? Yeah. Yeah, like a prefix, like maybe like a vector of Yeah, so in those other problems, we made this extra parameter called like prefix. And the reason we made that parameter was to keep track of the binary digits or the string characters that were being chosen by the previous calls, right? And the heading that we were supposed to write didn't have that parameter, but we added it because we decided we needed it. And that's often the theme of these problems, is we need some extra parameter or parameters to keep track of choices made by previous calls. So that's also the case here. So I think what we really want is some kind of method called like 
dice rolls helper, and it takes int dice. You said pass a vector, so um, you, you know we could try to use like a string prefix or a whatever, but I think what's happening here is we're choosing some dice number, and we want to remember all the dice numbers, and we eventually want to print them out like this. That's kind of how it looks when you print a vector or a collection of some kind. So, so maybe storing the roles we've chosen in a vector of integers, that might be a good way to do it. So vector of int uh, chosen, something like that. Usually when we pass collections as parameters, we pass them by reference, so all the calls will, will share the collection. I think I want to do that here as well. Um, if you want to get rolling, you, you basically, no pun intended, you, you want to have this guy call that guy to, this guy does all the real work, the one on the top, right? So basically I just want to call dice rolls helper, I want to pass my number of dice, and then I want to pass some kind of vector, and I mean, you just have to declare a vector in here, vector of int v, and then pass him, and he'll be chosen for the other call or something like that, okay? Empty vector, right? You understand? So like the only purpose of this is to start up this and give him a vector to share among all of his calls. Uh, people have asked about static vectors. I don't want static vector because once a single call of this is done, I want the vector to go away, basically. So that's why I don't want static vector. Okay, now, this helper is gonna be the real work. So remember the template here. Um, if there are choices to make, then for each, uh, you know, we're gonna handle one choice. So for each value for my choice, I will choose that value, I will search or explore what could follow choosing that value, and then when I come back, I will unchoose that value. So how do I know if there are choices to make? Well, what's a choice in this problem? What kind of, what amount of work does each call of your recursive function handle? Yes? It chooses the value for one die. So if, if I'm doing dice roll of three, there are probably going to be three calls, and each one of them will pick the value for one of the six dice. And the first call will try all the options that involve a one here. It'll try all the options that involve a two here. It'll try all the options that involve a three here. This second call will try all the options that involve a one in its spot, and a two in its spot, a three in its spot. This third call will try all the options that have a one here, a two here, a three here. So each call is handling all of the possibilities for its die, right? Okay, so if there are choices to make, how do you know if there are any choices to make? Well, this number of dice is the number of things you need to choose values for, right? So like, if the number of dice is zero, that's gonna be a base case, but maybe I'll come back to it in terms of what to do there. Otherwise, there are choices left to make, so for each possible value for my choice, my choice is a die that I'm managing. The values, the things I could choose for that die are the numbers one through six, right? So for each integer from one through six, I will try choosing that number and then exploring things that could follow that. How do I indicate that I am choosing that number? Yes? Put it in the vector, yeah, absolutely. Um, so chosen.add, the value i. And now let's explore all the things that could follow that choice, right? So that the exploring, the searching, that's usually the recursion part. So I'll call dice rolls helper. And what parameter do I pass first? Dice minus one, because I'm handling a die, so the remaining calls have one fewer die, dice that they need to handle. I'll pass the same chosen vector, because we're all sharing a chosen vector. Now when I come back to here, I've written unchoose, and I think the idea is like, I picked that my die was gonna have the value one, and then I explored. But now that I'm back, I wanna try what would happen if my die would have the value two. I don't want it to have both the value one and the value two. So I want to undo this so that I can wrap around with i2 and do it again with i of 2, do you understand? So the way to unchoose is just the opposite usually of what you did when you did the choosing part. So that would be chosen.remove, right? Uh, careful though, remove takes an index. You might think right i there, but that would imply like I'm removing the value of i from the vector, but that's not what remove takes as its parameter. It doesn't take a value to remove, it takes an index to remove. What index is my value at that I want to remove? 
it's the last value in the vector because as the calls are stacking up, they're putting things at the end of the vector. So it would be chosen dot size minus one. But wait, is that right? Because these calls all add things on to the end of the vector after my element. So is it true that my element is still going to be at the end right here? Doesn't it seem like all these guys' dice are going to be after mine? So why am, is this right? What do you think? No? Are you saying I've written wrong code? Are you saying I'm not a good programmer? Uh, what, what do you think? Is this right or wrong? Yeah. Uh, it should still be correct because each of those calls will return the dice from the end Ah, yes. You, you have good recursive zen. What you have said is exactly right. <laughs> the force is strong with this one. Um, what you said was, and this is correct, you said the other calls have this same exact code in them, so they are adding stuff and exploring stuff, but when their call comes back from what it does, they are going to remove their dice that they added. So in theory, every call cleans up after itself. Do you understand? Like the net result of any one call, when that call completely is done and returns, is that it has not put any more dice in there than there used to be, right? So every time I add one, I delete one. There's no imbalance. There's no way to get this without that or vice versa. So therefore, after this guy is done, I know that the vector is the same as, as it was before. So it is right for me to remove the last one. Now, if you don't believe that yet, I'll do some printing. We can check it, but it's, it's, it's right. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, could we use a linked list? Well, the good news is that the very right end, the far end of a vector is totally fast. The front end is the slow part because the front end involves shifting. The end end doesn't have any shifting. If we were adding an index zero, I would totally agree that maybe a vector wouldn't be as good as a linked list. That's a good point, but this is okay, I think. Okay, so this is pretty close, but there's just one thing that we haven't written yet is the base case. If we get to dice of zero, Remember, the base case means that the previous calls have already done work, and now there's no work left to do. All the dice values have been picked already by the time we get to here. So what am I supposed to do? Here. Yeah? Just print out the chosen vector in a nice format. Yeah, just print out what we chose. Print out the, the dice that we've chosen. It's supposed to print them with curly braces. That's exactly what the... the um, default printing of a vector looks like. So I can just do C out chosen endl. So base case. Uh, let's let's try it. So the oh function def do I have a typo? Uh, missing a curly. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't have a curly for this else here. Thanks. Uh, there. Okay. Compile. I've got some warnings about some unused things for elsewhere in the code. That's okay. Um, I've run it and what? What do I get? One, 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 two. I think it's working. You see that? Looks pretty good, huh? So just if, again, if you, if you want to sort of understand this a little more, like kind of see what's going on, I really think what you want to do, like I like to include, this is optional, but you can include this recursion.h, and then down here as you're doing each helper call, you can say see out recursion indent followed by uh, uh, helper space um, dice equals plus dice plus chosen equals plus chosen plus endl and just watch the calls and then let's see oh gosh lots of output <laughs> lots of output that's okay um, but let's look at it so um, if you call the helper with dice of three nothing is chosen then we call it with dice of two, and you chose a one. Then I call it with dice of one, I've chosen another one. At some point, I call it with dice of zero, which leads to a lot of output. Then this guy returns back to this guy, who now tries it with a two instead of a one. You see, so this guy goes back to here, and this guy goes on from his one to his two. So the kind of one through six get tried by him. Then this guy's entirely done, so he comes back to here. And so this guy tries a two for the second guy right there. So, I mean, you can kind of watch the tree of the calls um, in, this, in this format. Okay. And the output, of the lines that are indented to the left, those are the output lines, those are the base cases that we're bumping into each time, right? Now, this is really still an exhaustive search for the most part, but I did have to do this step of, um, of undoing the choices that I made. So I wanted to talk about that. Now, the uh, problems we did last time 
with like printing binary numbers, printing decimal numbers. We didn't have to unchoose anything there. And I don't know if you really remember what that code looked like. You might think for a second, like, why is that one? Why do we not have to unchoose on that one? But so just for a second, I wasn't really going to talk about this very much today. But let me just reopen the like permutations or something. So remember, we wrote permute, and then permute asked for a permute helper, and we passed a string or whatever. And so up here is our actual code, right? And there's no unchoosing here. You know, they're sort of like choose this character, explore permuting the rest, and there's no like unchoose down here after that, right? So why is there no unchoose? Yes? Uh, because we're not passing the string of a prefix by reference. Yeah, because we're not passing the string by reference. We are making a new string, which is our prefix plus another character. If this were a reference to a string and we were plus equalsing the character onto it, then after this helper call, we would have to do minus equal, or not minus equal, but we'd have to substring off the character to undo what we had chosen. So really, it's kind of an implementation detail that we're passing vectors by reference or passing strings by value. You might say, well, then maybe we should have passed the vector by value, and then we wouldn't have had to do the unchoosing, right? Maybe back over here in our code from today, maybe we should just delete this ampersand. I don't like that because I think that means we have to make a lot, a lot, a lot of copies of vectors. Strings we're making copies of in the other code, but strings are very little things, and vectors are kind of bigger and bulkier, and I don't really like the idea that we would be making lots and lots of recursive calls, and every single one would make a total copy of a vector that's growing and larger. So um, anyway, this is a problem that does an exhaustive search, but it has to do a cleanup step or an undo step after each um, recursive exploration is finished. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, like, how, at what point does copying a string become too expensive? Well, I mean, it's kind of arbitrary. Frankly, I don't know exactly how many bytes of memory a string uses versus a vector of a given size. Um, but I know that string elements are characters that are one byte each, and vector elements are ints that are four bytes each. So at least there's kind of a 4x kind of a thing going on there. And vectors have some other fields inside of them. So I don't know what the... What the um, threshold is before you would care about this. I mean, frankly, if I just delete the ampersand, it's probably not that bad. But I'm, I'm saying in general, if you're going to do this, these deep explorations, maybe you're exploring chess moves. You're trying to write an AI to solve a chess board. That shit's going to have millions of calls. There's so many moves upon moves upon moves that like, if every single recursive call is copying vectors, you're just sunk. Your algorithm can be really, really slow. Even if only vector, every vector only has 10 or 15 elements, it's just too many. So I, I think this is kind of the way we do it. It's the best practice for it. String, you know, if we were doing chessboard, maybe we would pass a string by reference too. Not because the strings are super long, but because we have so many calls. I think that would probably be the reason. Um, okay, anyway, that's dice rolls. Now, I'm not doing any, um, uh, uh, this issue of like some of the paths being bad or something, right? Like. Because I think I was talking about that was the difference between exhaustive search and backtracking was backtracking, sometimes you would get to an outcome that you didn't like as much. So let's talk about that aspect. So what if we modify this? Oh, this is just a picture of the call. So you don't need to see that. You guys are, are fine. Um, come on, come on. <laughs> my, my program can't even animate it properly. All right, whatever. Um, so where am I? Here, let's do one where not only do I want to roll the dice, but I want to show the ones where the two numbers I roll add up to a given sum, like a sum of seven. Or uh, three dice adding up to seven has you know, these kind of possibilities here. OK? So um, I think it's not very hard to make a sort of minimal change to convert our dice roll code into this. So I'm going to do that real quick. And then I want to like, talk about what could be better about the code after that. So. Um, let me just copy, I'll delete this print statement, but um, I've got a heading called uh, dice sum. Here it is. So I think what I want to do is I want to write void dice sum helper uh, int dice int desired sum vector of int reference chosen. And then I want to paste. And yeah, so now here I'm just going to say vector of int v, and then I'm going to call dice sum helper dice uh, desired sum comma v. So this method doesn't really do anything, just like the other one. 
Um, but now I want to focus on the, the helper here. So I think the main thing is we don't call dice rolls helper, we call dice sum helper, and we have to pass the desired sum still. So, okay, what's the minimal change? Right now this code says that its name is dice sum, but it doesn't look at sums at all. So I think the minimal change is just like, we don't always want to do this, right? Some of these are now bad. They don't add up to the right sum. Okay, well, I thought ahead. I, I, I prepared a little bit for class today. Um, if you want to get the sum of the contents of a vector, here's a, here's a function I wrote called sum all and it takes a vector and it just loops all the ints and just adds them up and it returns the sum. Just, I just didn't want to, my fingers, I get a lot of carpal tunnel. I didn't want to type that code out, so I just wrote that code for you. So um, here, I think in this sum helper, I just want to say like, if the sum of all the elements in the chosen vector is the desired sum, then I will print the vector. Otherwise I won't, so that, that'll probably work. So, Let's go up to just main for a second and make sure that main is calling this. Uh, right now main calls dice rolls. I'm going to comment that out. If you select lines and hit control slash, it uncomments or comments them. So now I'm doing dice sum of three comma seven. Um, so let's, I don't know what that is. Let's run this and then, okay. So I think it's working. Maybe I've made a mistake. Maybe that problem was too easy. In fact, I didn't even ask for your help. I just did it all by myself. I think it was just there to make me feel good, like I'm really smart. Um, okay, but I would claim that what we have done is not an ideal solution. It, it's functionally correct. What are some things that are not ideal about the solution that we have so far? Yes? Um, maybe instead of like summing them all at the end, like when you do like the recursive stuff, you can subtract the chosen from the desired sum, and then at the end, Ah, that's an interesting twist. I like what you're <coughs> suggesting. So you said, instead of adding everything up at the end, maybe I could sort of pass a smaller and smaller sum here and whittle it down towards zero. Why do you like that way better? No, you're right. I like your idea. I mean, I think the point is that it takes a minute to do this. It's like big O of N, right? And we're going to do this a lot of times. Every single time we hit a base case, we're going to do this. That's not that many complicated, but it's some. It's big O of N. And if we just sort of kept track of a sum somehow, or, or whittled down this sum to nothing, maybe that would accomplish the same goal without having to loop over all these vectors over and over and over. So I like that. Let's do that in just a second. Do you have a different suggestion, too? Um, if your correct sum is, too, like, is like larger than your desired sum, there's no reason to continue looking at iterations. And then if it's like too small, then yeah, yeah. That, so these are both, I'm not, there's not one right answer. You are both right here. Um, this code is wasting its time in some of its calls. Uh, as you said, sometimes I have, like if I'm rolling, if I want to roll four dice and I want to get a sum of exactly eight. Okay, four dice, sum of eight. If I roll the first two and I pick sixes, there's no way to get to a sum of eight if I already have 12, right? But this code is happily exploring all of that and then just choosing not to print what it has found. Do you understand? So uh, let me show, I think I have a picture of that. So here, uh, I've got three dice in this example. I wanna try to see three dice that add up to a sum of five. So, okay, if I pick six for the first one, you can't roll a negative one, right? So, I mean, that's, there's no point in even doing that tree there, right? all of the calls, there's a whole bunch of calls that would go under that that are a waste of time. And like here, if I pick a one and a five, in fact, actually I should color more of these red, right? Because if I, if I have two dice with a one and a four, I've already got five. And so the, the next die has to be at least a one, right? So actually this one should be colored red too. I haven't quite reddened enough of the tree, if anything. So do, do you see that that's an issue? And you, I think you also pointed out that this happens on the other side of things. If I want four dice that add up to um, 17, and I roll two ones, then even if the remaining two dice come up as sixes, I can't add all the way up to get to 70, right? So I can't, it's like if you're too far off in either direction, then your code is wasting its time, right? Yeah. Do you need to worry about uh, repetitive cases? Like there are a few instances where one, one, five came up 
Oh, what, like 115 versus 511. In this example, I'm just assuming that those are distinct and it's okay to print both of them. If I cared about the those as being the same, I would probably want some sort of uh, sorted, ordered collection or something where those would come out. Like we did an anagram example where anagrams would be the same because we sorted the letters. I'd probably want to do something vaguely like that here where I would match those as being equal and I wouldn't explore those twice. Yeah, that would, that, there is a variation of this where I would worry about that. I, I'd rather ignore that for this problem, but, but yeah. Um, anyway, so some of these, so, so uh, those were both good observations. Uh, your first observation was computing the sum over and over is wasteful. And your second observation was uh, don't explore, let's say, trees. Uh, sometimes we call them call trees or decision trees. Uh, where the values are too low or high to, to ever possibly get to the right answer, okay? So how do we do those things? Well, I want to do yours first with the, the, the summing part. So I think what you said was, if I choose I for my die, so like remember, I'm trying to get the desired sum of uh, 15 or something, right? So now for my die, I choose like three. So really the remaining dice I could tell it that I'm looking for a desired sum of 12 instead of 15. I could pull that out of there. So I think there's two ways you could do this. You could either subtract down this guy down to zero, or you could somehow keep another int that's counting up to see if it gets up to desired sum. Those are sort of equally good. Um, there are pros and cons to each one. I think if you don't mind, I'd rather do the one where I keep another int and I count it up. For, and I'll show you why in a second. I think that'll help with the other suggestion of the bounding of things. But but like. What if I added in something like uh, int my sum so far? In other words, like that's the sum of the stuff that's currently in the chosen vector. So in a sense, this is completely redundant information because I already have that vector. I could loop over it to get the sum, but why don't I separately keep the sum so I don't have to loop over, I don't have to do the work, right? So in other words, down here, when you first start out, you've got a, a, a sum so far of, of zero, so I'll just pass zero for that. But now up here, Whenever I am making a recursive call, what do I pass as the sum so far to the next call? It's going to be related to that sum, right? Whatever the previous calls chose is that. And now I'm choosing i, so I should do the sum so far plus i, right? Well, plus equal will modify the variable. I don't think I want to modify it because when the loop wraps around, I want it not to be added, so I can add the next i. Each, each loop around, I want it to be the original value plus the next i. So, so I think this is good for that. Now, what I want this for, so far that doesn't optimize the code any. What you're getting at is I think now here, instead of saying sum all of chosen, I can say if my sum so far equals that. Okay, so those are, that's just like a, a, an optimization speeded up a little bit in terms of the looping over the vector. That's good. Um, okay, so I think we did number one. I mean, I guess we should run it, make sure I didn't break it, right? But, uh, <laughs> wow, big fun. It, it looks like, I think it's printing the right um, stuff still. Okay, so we did number one. Now let's do number two. Now, um, real quick, I want to do a hack to learn something about the code. Uh, I want to count how many recursive calls it's currently making, okay? So like up here, I'm going to make uh, an evil global variable calls equals zero. No, 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 not like this. Never do this. <laughs> Whatever, right? Um, uh, right, so don't, don't do that, but I just did it. So um, I guess I could have done a static variable. I don't know, whatever. But so here, I'm going to call dice sum, and then when I'm done, I'm going to print the number of calls that I, that I made. And then in terms, of, oh, in terms of counting the number of calls, I'm going to go up here to this helper, and I'm just going to say calls plus plus. Base case, recursive case, I don't care. Just, it's a call. OK, so I run it. And it prints all the things and it says calls 259. Okay, fine. Maybe you think for a minute, why is it 259? But okay, so that's cool. Um, 259 calls, right? Um, what about if it's four dice? Four dice and I count up to uh, 11 or something. Um, let's comment out that call. Let's go four dice up to 11. Let's run it makes 1,555 calls, slightly more than, it's around, uh, what, six times the number of calls from the last one, coincidentally. Uh, so, okay. 
Uh, fine, I'll put it back to three dice just to keep it a little less output. Uh, yeah, question. Why is it not two and six? Why is it not exactly uh, uh, six to the third? Um, well, let's see, what is six to the third? Python. Six times six times six. So <laughs> two hundred sixteen. So that's how many it would be if it were exactly. I think because we actually make a fourth call for the base case to print. Do you know what I mean? Like we pick the three dice and then we make a fourth call with dice set to zero. And that one. Should be this. But in this case, it's just one call, right? It's not as if it's branching out. Sure, but we hit that bottom every single time we finish an exploration path of the tree. So it should be 216 plus 16. Well, look, we can walk the tree and count the nodes up if you want. I do think that every time we add another die, we're going up by roughly a factor of times six here. But look, I mean, I, I think the important thing is I want to count the number of calls that we save once we make this optimization that we called like number two. So the number two optimization was don't explore the tree where the value is too high. Oh, you have your hand up? What was your comment? Yeah. Sorry, that's me annoying, but like, I think the number of calls is going to be 6 to 0 plus 6 to 1 plus 6 to 0 plus 6 to 1. Oh, so it's, it's more like uh, 6 to the 0, 6 to the 0 plus 6 to the 1 plus 6 to the 2 plus 6 to the 3. Yeah, that's better. That's actually exactly the number of calls that it is. Yeah, so um, I was using the wrong math. Thank you for being better at math than me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Here, that's, I, I, you should be thanked more properly. Uh, for i in range 1,000, print, great job. <laughs> Bam. OK, there. Good stuff. Yeah, anyway, go take 103 and 109, and then you'll be better at combinatorics than I am. Uh, whatever. But OK, so I want to not explore those decision trees if you can't possibly get to the right answer, OK? So here's the part where I'm doing pick a number and then explore and then put it back. I think we need some sort of if statement here that says like, if this path is good, I want to explore. But if this path is bad, I don't want to explore, right? Well, how do I know if the path is good or bad? How do I know if it's possible? Maybe I can give you a hint. Can you help me calculate what would be the least and the greatest value that I could possibly build. So like maybe here, calculate least and most, uh, you know, sort of the min and max possible sums. So like what's the minimum sum if I chose I for the next die? Yes? It's my sum so far. Plus, I'm saying that I guess I would choose I for my die, right? Plus, what's the least I could do with the rest that would follow that? It'd be like rolling a one on all of the dice minus one remaining dice, right? That's, if I pick I for me, then that's the least that could follow me, right? Okay, and then the max would be I choose I, and then all the remaining dice are high rollers. They're all six, right? OK, so now that I have those boundaries, I think the if statement is easier to write, right? If what, then I should do this. Yeah? If, if the desired sum minus my sum so far hmm? is Yeah, I think I think that's pretty close. Basically, just if the oh, min and max, max, if the desired sum is between the min and the max, I think yeah. is when we want to do this, right? So if the min is less than or equal to sum and the desired sum is less than or equal to max, then I want to choose and explore and then unchoose, right? 
Okay, let's try it out. Remember how we had 259 calls and then we had 1,500 calls or whatever, right? So um, uh, let's run it. So for one thing, do I get the right output? Well, it looks like I do. I have 36 calls. So I think this is printing all the same lines of output as before. And we're 36. It's a lot fewer calls. Um, if I go back to four dice, uh, Wait, not that one. If I comment out this and uncomment out that, remember I was 1,500, I think, or so? Now it's 245, so it's definitely eliminating quite a lot of those calls. So between removing those sums that we didn't need to calculate, removing these calls we didn't need to make, this is a lot better version of the code. It removes some of this overhead and slowness and stuff that people associate with too much recursion. So uh, on homework problems, sometimes I will say to you, your code needs to like prune the tree of decisions by avoiding branches that are bad and this is the sort of thing I'm talking about like if you know that the place you've gotten to so far in your previous calls cannot possibly lead to an answer you should exit immediately without making more recursive calls after that do you understand yep Right, so I mean another way of writing this code, which I think I'll leave for you to play with on your own, would be instead of passing the sum so far, pulling the i that you're choosing out of here and shrinking this. And then you only have three parameters. That slightly changes this logic in some ways. I, to me, in my head, this version makes sense, but I think the version where you subtract out is totally fine. You can totally write the problem to solve it that way. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Since we're clearing out the vector by the time we're done with the function anyway, wouldn't it be more efficient to make the vector a static variable and not have a you know, helper function with a parameter for clearing out? So it's going to be empty by the end. Well, again, like I think, I think you guys uh, maybe like static variables more than, than I do, which is the thing about a static variable is it will stay there after the recursion is all done. Like after the call is completely, completely done, it'll stay with whatever contents it has. Now you're saying you're pulling the contents back out of it so it'll be empty by the end of that, so maybe that's okay. And that's fine, I mean, you, you could do that. I think there are versions of these algorithms where you don't always 100% of the time clean up the vector perfectly. Maybe if you reach a dead end, you just immediately exit the whole thing for some reason, and now the vector isn't empty. So I, I find, and also another thing to keep in mind is that static variables don't exist in a lot of languages. And so I don't want to teach you too many hacks that only work in C++. Um, you're totally right that in this problem, all the vector elements get cleaned up before you return. And so a static variable could work because you would start empty every time. I think as a general case, you typically make a, a local variable and pass it around. That's typically what you do here. Um, anyway, yeah, those are, those are reasonable variations. Um, I want to show you another problem. I just want to try to get one more done while we have time. So blah, blah, blah. I talked about pruning the tree. Okay, great. Um, just side thing. Uh, I'm not going to code this, but like, what if you did want to solve his question of like, I want to print 115, but not 151 and not 511. How do I make it not do that? You can think of lots of different ways. It's a rhetorical question. I'm not going to call you for an answer to it, but um, like there are a lot of different ways you could accomplish that. And actually, you can get it to work with a very, very small change to the code. Uh, so if you're picturing something fancy with sets and vectors and counting things or whatever, uh, that, that you can do it with less work than that. So that's something to think about. But um, I want to do one more problem, which is called sublists. I would have called it subsets, but it's technically not a mathematical set so, or, or the data structure of a set. What I want to do is. I'll pass you a vector of, of strings, like names or whatever. I want to print all of the possible subsets, the power set, basically, of that uh, list of uh, names. So like uh, one of the subsets is the whole thing, and one of the subsets has just Jane and Bob in it, or, or just Bob, or just Matt, or whatever, and also one subset is, is none of these people, zero people, right? I don't care what order they get printed in, I just want to print them all out. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, it kind of feels like that permutation problem where we're looping around and choosing a name and exploring and stuff. And one of the reasons I've chosen this problem is that if you kind of go down that path with this, I think what you find is you end up with something that isn't quite right. Um, so, I mean, 
picture what that code might look like. You'd say, okay, I want to do all the subsets. So I'm going to loop over the strings and I'm going to choose one and explore the other ones or something like that, right? That's kind of how most people's code starts. Like you, um, uh, let me go to my, my, my queue creator here. Uh, I'm going to comment out this main, main dice. And then uh, I've got a file called sublists here. And I'm just going to work in here now. So I made a name, a, a, a set of names, and I call sublist on it. And I'm pretty sure this is just an empty function. OK, so um, how do you do it? Well, a lot of people think like, OK, well, I need to, or, or maybe I have some kind of helper, I don't know. But I need to do like some kind of for loop, int i equals 0, i is less than v dot size, i plus plus. So like, I'll choose element i from the vector. So I'll say like string s equals v i, and then I'll do v dot remove i, or you know what I mean? Like I'll choose that one. That's kind of what most people start with here. I want you to believe me that this isn't usually the way you want to do it. And kind of the big lesson I want to teach you today, or, or in this example problem, is that these backtracking and searching problems don't always involve looping over all the things. And I think most of the problems I've been showing you are loop over all the things and pick a thing. This one is not that way. So let me try to show you why. Um, if you did that, what I was just starting to kind of write, you'd end up with something that looked kind of like this for your like decision tree. You'd say, well, hmm, these are all the people available and I haven't chosen anybody yet, so maybe I'll try choosing Jane and then I'll explore who else I could choose or whatever, right? Um, and then after I finish exploring that, maybe I'll come back and I'll say, no, I'm not gonna pick Jane anymore, I'm gonna pick Bob and I'll see what I could do with that, you know, right? But what you find is that you end up doing stuff like this. You have Bob Jane versus having Jane Bob. You've got the same two people. And those are not distinct from each other in the case of this problem. So I don't really want to think about this as being separate from, from that. I don't want to explore that both of those ways. <laughs> and actually, really what I'm kind of doing here is I'm doing permutations of the vector. I'm resolving that permute string problem just with a vector now. And that's not the problem. That's not the question that I'm being asked to solve here. So I'm, I think I'm kind of over pattern matching. Um, okay, so what's, what's the flaw? What's the problem? What do I really need to do? I think this comes back to this notion of like each call makes a choice. We have misunderstood what those choices are for this problem. The choices are not who should go first in the vector of outcome and who should go second and who should go third. That's what permutations are. This is supposed to be subsets. So like if I'm printing subsets, if I'm going to think about Bob, what's a choice you might make about Bob that has to do with the output that you're printing? Yeah? Decides to include or not include him? Whether or not Bob should be included in the set. It doesn't matter if he's first or third or whatever. It's whether he's present or absent. That's the real choice. Not order, but inclusion exclusion. So rather than a tree that says who goes first, who goes second, the tree should look more like this. Hmm, let's look at Jane. Should Jane be there or not? Those are the two possibilities. If I try to decide that she is going to be in there, hmm, let's look at Bob. Should he be in there or not? And for each of those choices, we go on. Same thing here. If I didn't keep Jane, I'll try keeping Bob. I'll try not keeping Bob. Next, I'll try keeping Matt. I'll try not keeping Matt. Similar idea. Different decision tree, you see? It forks in two, not in four each step. So really, in terms of the, what the call, what your call does, I think you still want a helper. Void sublists where you say uh, vector v, but you also, maybe we call it sublist helper, but you also pass a vector of strings that you've chosen, something like that, uh, like that. And then this guy here just says vector of strings chosen and calls sub list helper v chosen. OK, fine. Now this guy, rather than looping over all the elements, why don't we just say that he's going to handle the first one or he's going to handle one of them. And he's going to decide whether that one gets kept or excluded. So something like string mine equals v0, v dot remove 0. So I'm choosing this person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle what's to be done with this person. Okay. So now I'm supposed to explore or search. So this is like me choosing, I guess. But really, I have to choose whether to keep them or exclude them. 
So how do I choose? There's, there's two branches here. There's one that's like, yes, include them. And there's one that's no, exclude them, right? So what's the include them? How do I like do that? Yes? I see. Well, so you said we need to figure out um, which element is this call going to process. So we could pass an index or something like that. I think another way of doing it is just like, let's all agree that everybody picks the element at a certain index. Pick the last one, take the first one, whatever. It's simple. That way you don't have to explicitly pass that. I think we could just say each call processes the first element and removes it out. If you want to include that element in the chosen vector, you can just add it to the chosen vector, right? You can add mine, my choice. The exploration is a recursive call, right? You say sublist helper with v and chosen. v is smaller now and chosen is larger now, potentially larger now, right? When this comes back, I want to try a version of this where I don't include that person. How do I not include them? Well, I don't want them to be in the chosen vector, so I'll do chosen.remove. Again, it's the last element of the chosen vector, so I'll do chosen.size minus one. I want to do a whole nother tree with them not in there. So I want to do this again, like that. I could have done them in the opposite order, but like I'm doing one exploration with them and one exploration without them. There's no base case here. What's the base case? I'm running out of time, so we'll do this fast. What's the base case? V size is zero. What do I do when I see that? I print what I've chosen, right? So if V dot, there actually is an is empty method. If V is empty, see out, chosen, endl, else we'll do all this other stuff. So let me, let me try that out. And hopefully we got it working and then we go home. Uh, I run it and Womp, womp. That's not quite right. That's not quite right. Because you always never unchose. I never unchose, which means putting them back in V. And what, what do I need to do here? No, we should add the thing that we're using from vector line. Because it's a reference. I tell you what, I've already gone over. So I'm going to stop there. And first thing Friday is we'll fix it. Okay? I don't want to keep you late. So next time. Go to section. Bye.